Hey, welcome back to Extra Grace. Today we're talking all about home remedies for fall and the winter. Now, if you're a very beginner with herbs, I suggest you go back and watch our workshop from June about medicinal herbs for beginners. Let me know if you need that link. Send me an email. Um, but it is in our member area in the Google Drive folder. Today we're going to kind of zone in specifically on remedies and herbs that are good for fall and winter for the colder weather months and that treat the common ailments that tend to hit during that time. So we're going to start with one of the most popular remedies and one of the most powerful remedies for cold and flu and that is elderberry syrup. So I'm going to pass it over to my good friend Julie who is our guest expert this month and she is going to tell you all about how to make elderberry syrup. Welcome to my kitchen. This is Misty Creek Acres. I am Julie and I have been making and selling elderberry syrup for years now and I want to just show you the process that I go through to make your own elderberry syrup. So the first thing I do is I get really good quality elderberries. I get organic elderberries. I grow some. I have some plants here. I think I have about 12 elderberry plants right now. Um, but sometimes the birds decide to eat my elderberries and I have to buy some. So get organic elderberries um, wherever you can get them. I just prefer, prefer organic just because adding pesticides to your um, wellness routine is really probably not going to be very helpful. <laughs> so try to find as many organic ingredients as you can possibly get. Also, if you're planning on using honey as a sweetener, I suggest that you get the best quality local honey that you can get. Um, if you have your own beehive, that would be even better. But sometimes we just can't do that. And like for us, our bees aren't doing very well this year. So we had to get some local honey for us as well. And so you really just need a few ingredients to get started with elderberry syrup. It's really not too complicated, I promise. You need elderberries, you need cinnamon sticks, you need clove, and you need rose hips, and you need ginger. And then after that, you can just add whatever you like. Today, I'm adding nettle leaf to my elderberry syrup because that is a really good um, herb for allergies, and this is kind of allergy season. So that's what we're gonna start with today. Before we start making our elderberry syrup, let's talk about why you should take it. Um, elderberry itself, the specific kind of elderberry, the black elderberry has been the only one that's actually gone through any kind of testing. But I personally believe any form of elderberry is probably just fine and just as great. But um, there have been some tests to show that elderberry helps with cold and flu symptoms. Um, a lot of people use it to boost their immune, immune system to help prevent illness. And so that's what a lot of people use it for. Even years and years ago, thousands of years ago, people used elderberry for the same reasons. That's just what it's known for. It's an anti-inflammatory. It's um, an, I was going to say antibiotic, but it's not. It's an antiviral. Um, Depending on the ingredients that you use, it can help with um, your heart as well. And so it's really just an overall good herb to have in your medicinal wellness cabinet. Elderberries can just prove so many uses. You can even make an elderberry tea. You can use the flowers. It's just a very good plant to grow. If you're interested in having your own herb garden for medicinal purposes, add elderberry to it. We are going to use one cup of elderberries, and that is all we're using today. So first, we're gonna get about five, four or five cups of water in your pot. Now, I use filtered water. Um, 
you do whatever is best for you and then I, we're going to get it heated up and then we're going to add our cup of elderberries as you can see this is what dried elderberries look like they are very tiny and if you've ever had an elderberry plant that you've harvested the elderberries you know the painstaking process to get all the elderberries off of that plant um, and then to dry them and then you're like I really thought I had more than that that is one of the reasons why elderberries cost a good amount is because the harvesting aspect of elderberry plants takes a lot, takes a long time. So I have one cup of elderberries. Now I do about seven to 10 rose hips in my elderberry syrup. And then I do four sticks of cinnamon and then about the same number of cloves as rose hips. So seven to 10 cloves. And then I do half a teaspoon. I have ginger powder instead of actually ginger root, but either one is fine. So I do about half a teaspoon of ginger powder. And then since I'm doing the nettle leaf with this batch of elderberry syrup, I'm adding a fourth a cup of nettle. We're gonna let that start heating up. So while we're letting this heat up, let's talk about these ingredients a little bit more. So um, elderberries are rich in antioxidants which is huge for your body. Um, and they actually help combat oxidative stress. So they're gonna help um, fight, fight off free radicals, which you're gonna be in contact with free radicals everywhere. So anything that's gonna help combat free radicals, you wanna try to use. <laughs> then you have cinnamon. So um, cinnamon actually will help regulate blood sugar. If you know anybody that has problems with blood sugar, they might even take a cinnamon supplement. So um, cinnamon helps with blood sugar issues. And it also, it just makes it taste really, really good. It has a warming effect and it can soothe discomfort. Um, ginger is huge for anti-inflammatory benefits. Ginger is great for infl inflammation. Um, and then, of course, I think most people know that ginger helps when you feel like a little nauseous and upset stomach. And so that's really good to add in this wellness arsenal. And then you have rose hips. Rose hips are mostly known for their vitamin C. They are huge vitamin C boost. So that is really good to add in your elderberry syrup. And then you have clove. So clove is also an anti-inflammatory, but it's also antimicrobial. So anytime you can get a little bit of antimicrobial benefits, you're going to be better off. <laughs> and then it also helps alleviate res um, respiratory symptoms as well. So you have a really strong powerhouse. And then when you add honey to it, I think most people know about the benefits of honey, but honey is really, really amazing for you. Even if you just were to take a teaspoon of honey a day by itself, it might would help with your allergy symptoms alone especially if you get local honey. So um, honey is going to have a lot of benefits, but it can also help soothe cough and sore throat. And then um, it also makes the, the syrup a little bit sweeter. Now, our syrup does not have preservatives. It does not have thickening agents in it. It's just all natural. So it's not thick. I know it's called syrup, but really it's a very thin liquid. Even when you add honey to it, it kind of thins it out. So we're not adding all these thickening agents that aren't necessary to our syrup. And that's done on purpose. We want something as natural as possible. We don't want chemicals. If you look at the ingredients on the elderberry syrups that are in the stores that are made by pharmaceutical companies, they have all kinds of preservatives and thickening agents in them. And truthfully, they're just not necessary, but they put them in there to help preserve shelf life. So um, we don't need that. And we don't need a lot of sugar. When sugar enters your body, your body is not going to be able to fight off infections as well. So the least sugar, the better. And even though honey is good for you, it's still sweetener. It's still what it is. Okay, our elderberry syrup is really starting to heat up now. And we're stirring it. I like using a wooden spoon, but that's just a preference. Um, I also use the cast iron pots for this. But again, preference. Um, we're letting it come to a boil. And then after it comes to the bowl, we're going to reduce it. There we go. 
we're going to reduce it down to a simmer for about 30 minutes and you want to come in and stir it every once in a while and um, it's really in my face now so um, what we're doing is reducing it down now you don't eat elderberries raw okay they can really cause an upset stomach they're not going to kill you but it's not going to make you feel good either so you don't eat elderberries raw you want to cook them down to get any of those toxins out that cause upset stomach basically is what it's for and then you're left with a really really good syrup you don't have to keep stirring it either so we're going to let this simmer for about 30 minutes we have let our elderberries cook and simmer down a little bit and now it's time to strain everything out and get it in our jars. So as you can see, this is what the elderberry looks like now that it's cooked. Now, you're going to let this sit and strain for a little while because you want as much of that juicy goodness in this bowl as you can possibly get. We're even going to mash it a little bit once it's cooled just a smidge. So let it sit for a few minutes and finish straining and draining out all that good juice. So this has been sitting for a few minutes. It is still pretty warm. That's okay. What we're gonna do, we're gonna, I'm taking a wooden spoon, but you do whatever you have. We're gonna mash down into the strainer to get all the juice out of these elderberries. Now I know these are called elderberries. They're not sweet. Um, they're not like a strawberry or blueberry or anything like that. They're pretty tart. That's why people like adding sweetener to it because it's not sweet. It's not sweet like yummy berry. And I think my personal opinion, um, they were designed like that by God so that we wouldn't eat them raw because eating them raw is not good for us. So I think that that is done on purpose. That's just me. While this is cool in just a few more minutes, I wanted to talk about some additions you can add to your elderberry syrup. So I have um, honey. Now I'm doing, it's about three fourths cup of honey. You can do as much as you want. Some people do equal parts honey to liquid. I just believe this is elderberry syrup, not like honey flavored with elderberry, if that makes sense. So I don't do as much honey. Now, a lot of times I add essential oils to my elderberry syrup. So in my honey, I will do a couple of drops of these essential oils. So you absolutely do not have to. You, um, you can keep it like it is right now. But for, for my family, we like to add these essential oils to it. So I literally do one drop of each because they're so powerful. So I do oregano. I do nutmeg and again all these essential oils have all the similar properties for boosting your immune system cardamom and thyme now sometimes I also add a lemon essential oil um, or you can do orange to just add a little bit more flavor and those citrus essential oils also have really good anti-inflammatory properties in them as well so you don't want to mix your honey with your syrup when your syrup is super hot still. So we're just going to let it sit a few more minutes to cool off before we add our honey. Because if you put the honey in there when it's too hot, the honey will lose all of its medicinal value. You don't want that. So we're going to wait a little bit longer before we add our honey. Okay, let's add our honey to this.
You just want to let it stir up and get all infused, melt it in with your liquid. So after you have your elderberries themselves, you can actually feed that to your chickens if you have chickens. They love them. Boost their immune system too. Help them out. And y'all, that's it. You have elderberry syrup. You can put this in your jars and store it for weeks, up to six weeks, I would say, in the refrigerator. Now you can water bath, can this elderberry syrup. I will water bath it for about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, I have several jars and um, that's what I do when I sell it. And I will say that when you water bath can it, it does heat the honey up so much that it doesn't really have as many medicinal properties to it, but the honey still is in there for the sweetness. So that's what we do. And there is your jar of elderberry syrup. You can take one tablespoon a day as an adult to just preventatively keep your immune system boosted. If you happen to get sick, you can take four tablespoons a day. Um, children, usually it's about a teaspoon a day. And um, like under one, you could still give this to an, a baby or a younger child. Um, maybe omit the honey or you could use agave nectar instead of honey. Um, so that's a couple ways that you can use this, but that's what we do. Here's your elderberry syrup. I hope that you make yours and it tastes amazing and you stay nice and healthy this year. I just wanted to share with you quickly the three types of elderberry kits that I have available um, to purchase either on my Etsy shop or my website, mrcreekacres.com. So I developed three different kits. I originally started out with the original standby that everybody goes to, the basic ingredients, <clears throat> elderberries, cinnamon, ginger, and then clove, rose hips. That's the basic for an elderberry DIY kit, which is what I have right here. This is your basic elderberry DIY kit. This kit is the large size and it will make two pint size jars. That's usually plenty for a family for a month, okay? Depending on how regular you are, or if somebody actually does get sick, then you're gonna, of course, give them more elderberry syrup, so it might not last that long. But anyway, this is your standard elderberry DIY kit that I have been using and selling now for years. Um, this is pretty much what my elderberry syrup is that I have, that I make. And then it just depends on the, the season as to if I'm going to use the other two kits. So the other kit I have is one that has extra immune support. This one has added to it echinacea, um, which is an amazing, powerful herb for your immune system. Um, if you can't grow it, this is the best way to go. So I have dried echinacea in here to help boost your immune system even more. So you have the basic kit plus echinacea. Then the other option you have is the elderberry DIY kit with allergy support. So the difference in this kit is I have dried nettle leaf in here. Nettle has long been known to be a very good support for your immune system, but also for allergy relief and an antihistamine. So this is a wonderful way to go. If you suffer with seasonal allergies or just in general, it's just like you're always having allergy problems, this is a way to go. So those are the three basic kits that I sell that can help you with different, whatever your situation may be because everybody's different. Everybody's family is different. So you might need one rather than the other, or you can get the basic kit and add to it whatever you want to. A lot of people like to add orange peel, lemon peel to their elderberry syrup, which is a great additive and it makes it have that little citrus flavor to it that sometimes maybe kids would prefer. So um, three kits, three kits all available and it has the same directions on the back of the bag.
You just have the extra herb added depending on which one you need. Now that you've made your elderberry syrup, I'm going to show you another recipe for something called fire cider. Now, fire cider is something that you can find a thousand different recipes for. Everybody seems to make it their own unique way. But I'm going to show you how I make it for my family. And here's a sneak preview of what it looks like as it's steeping. But let me just pass you on over and you can watch how I make this. Let's make some fire cider together. So I'm making my fire cider in quart jars and I'm using wide mouth jars just because that's a little simpler to get it all in there. And I'm going to start by cutting up my citrus fruits. So I like to add half of a lemon and half of an orange to each jar. Now you could totally do this in a larger jar and do like a half gallon at a time. All of my big jars are just currently being used for other ferments at the moment. So we had to do quart jars this year for fire cider. So here you see me squeezing the lemon slices just a bit to release some of the juices. And then I drop them straight into the jar. And then we start working on the oranges. So again, just half an orange in each quart jar, and that seems to work out perfectly. Squeeze the juices out a little, and then place your slices in the jar. Next up, we're going to add an apple. So we're going to put half an apple in each of the quart jars. You want to cut out the core and just remove that, but I leave the peel on. Place my apple slices in the jar, and now we're done with the fruits. So let's move on and add some spices. First up is cinnamon sticks. Now you can totally vary this part up however you like it, but I'm adding three cinnamon sticks to each jar and then I'm adding a few cloves. Um, cloves are highly medicinal, they're antimicrobial, and they also add lots of flavor. They're very warming, which is good when you're sick. So I add a few cloves to each jar. Then we're bringing out the ginger. Now, a lot of people like to add sliced ginger to their fire cider, but I actually prefer to grate it. I feel like this releases a lot of those volatile oils inside and gives you a better finished product. So I'm grating my ginger, and then I'm going to do the same thing with this turmeric root. And I'm doing about a thumb-sized piece of turmeric, and I'm dividing that between my two quart jars. Turmeric is very anti-inflammatory, which makes it a great fit for fire cider. It's a, a must-have when you're facing any kind of sickness. Next up is the garlic, and we are adding about a dozen cloves of garlic to each quart jar. Lots and lots of garlic because garlic is a powerful medicinal plant. And it is so helpful, especially for respiratory colds and flus. And so we want to leverage that and use lots of garlic in our fire cider. Then we add an onion, which is another surprising medicinal plant. Onions are very good for any sort of bacterial issue. Then rosemary. And I'm also going to be adding lemon balm. Both of those are good herbs for fire cider that have great medicinal value and properties. I really love lemon balm because it's an, an anti-anxiety herb. And, you know, with recent pandemics, sometimes getting sick can stir up a little anxiety. So I add lemon balm to my fire cider just to be extra calming. Next up is our raw honey, and I'm adding about a cup of raw honey to each jar. And you're going to want to let this kind of work its way down around all the other ingredients. You can tell here I'm not measuring. This is not an exact science, but just about a cup per jar is perfect. And you want to use raw local honey, if at all possible. That has the most medicinal value, and it's especially helpful for seasonal allergies. The final ingredient to our fire cider is apple cider vinegar. And this is the trickiest part of the process because our jar is very full and that honey likes to sit up at the top. So you want to grab a little butter knife and sort of work it around to let the honey run down in between all of your other ingredients and make room for fire cider. You don't want any gaps or air bubbles in there. So just keep working at it until you can fill it completely full with the apple cider vinegar. You're only going to leave maybe an inch of space at the top. 
and you have to kind of go slowly at this and just add a little at a time. But once you get it full, your fire cider is complete. And at this point, you can add a lid and a ring, give it a shake. You may want to cover underneath the lid with a piece of parchment paper to prevent rust. But this is how I make my fire cider. And we're going to let this sit and ferment for about a month and then strain it out and preserve the liquid and keep it in the fridge as an easy treatment for colds and flu. Welcome to my home at Misty Creek Acres. I am Julie and I wanted to just talk to you briefly about fire cider. Um, I have made my own fire cider and I was going to show you what it looks like and we're also going to talk about the ingredients that are in my fire cider kit. So I have a kit. It's a small little kit of fire cider ingredients. Now you of course can add to these ingredients, but these are pretty much the basic ingredients in any fire cider recipe. Let's talk about them real quick. So the first ingredient is horseradish. Now, when you hear that, you might be like, Ugh. and you know, horseradish is not like my go-to, <laughs> but it actually helps clear sinuses and it has a lot of anti-inflammatory, antibacterial properties in it. Surprisingly enough, I know. This also contains ginger, which aids in digestion. And if you have digestive issues, ginger is great to add to your wellness arsenal. Then it also has onion and garlic. Onion and garlic have been well known for their antibacterial properties. Onion actually helps with coughing as well. So if you need a decongestant, expectorant, fire cider is really a great go-to. Then lastly, we have red pepper flakes. Red pepper flakes are gonna help your circulatory system, keep you warm, help your body just flow. And that is exactly what it needs to do, especially if you're fighting something. Then you mix all that in apple cider vinegar. So I think we all know how good apple cider vinegar might be for us. Um, if you're anything like me, you've heard about it for years that a lot of people take like a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar every day. It helps with digestion also, helps with energy, and it really is great for your gut health. A lot of people have many benefits of apple cider vinegar. They've talked about it being good for blood sugar control and um, blood pressure problems. So apple cider vinegar itself is great for you. So you combine apple cider vinegar with these herbs in this kit and you have a powerhouse for your immune system. And all you have to do is take one tablespoon a day one tablespoon a day and you'll be good to go. Some people end up taking this before meals, like an hour before meals, and it aids in their digestion as well. So that's another way that you can use fire cider. You can use it preventatively every day, one tablespoon a day, or you can use it when you actually are feeling sick and take it up to four times a day. It is not the same as elderberry syrup. So there are different benefits. There are some similarities, but they're both different. So you could do both at the same time. Take your fire cider in the morning before you eat. Take your elderberry at night before you go to bed. Easy way to combine both of them and have a really healthy winter. So you've made elderberry syrup and you've made fire cider. Now let's talk about a few more fall and winter remedies that you might want to add to your home apothecary. The first thing that I would suggest for the winter months is one that a lot of people don't think of, and that is a calendula oil. So calendula is the pretty yellow happy flowers that I grew in my raised bed garden this year at the entrance. And I'll insert a video of them here. They were beautiful and we loved growing calendula, but it's actually super powerful for skincare. It's very soothing and it's known to be a good remedy for things like eczema. Anything with dry skin is going to respond really well to this one. And so here is a calendula oil that I've already infused and you basically just put your petals from the flowers or your flower heads into an oil, a carrier oil. Now I used olive oil for this infusion. You can also use coconut oil or almond oil, really whatever you like, any kind of oil will do. And you wanna let it sit for about four weeks. Give it a shake every day 
and then strain it out and then we keep this stored on the apothecary shelf. You're really supposed to store these in a cool dark place if possible, but if you're like me and space to challenge, a bookshelf will do. So that's the first one, calendula oil for anything skin related. You know, in the winter we get a lot of dry chapped skin. Another common winter problem, especially if you have little children in the house, is earaches. And there's nothing more power, more painful than an earache, but I found a really powerful solution. And this is one that I recently tried myself about two weeks ago. Um, I started getting sick and I knew I had an ear infection. I had that, you know, telltale searing pain in one of my ears. And so I gave my remedy a try and it worked. Within two days, my earache was gone. I never ended up needing to go in for an antibiotic. So I really recommend this one. So this is a long infusion of what I made when I had an earache. And again, all you're doing is an infusing in oil. So I chose olive oil, but you could do any carrier oil you like. And in my oil, I have mullein leaves. So mullein is a powerful medicinal plant and it's one that grows wild in many places. And then I have a bunch of chopped garlic there in the bottom. And so every day I'm shaking this. I keep all of my little infusions on the window still back there. So I'll remember to shake them every day. They get a little help from the sun and infusing. And then after a month, we'll strain this out and bottle it up. And I like to use these little dropper bottles for those because it's really convenient. And you just do four to five drops in the ear that hurts two to three times a day. You really can't overuse it. It's, it's really soothing. You can also warm it just a little bit first and that will help soothe the ear pain as well. So garlic and mullein are the magic ingredients that seem to really cure or help aid an earache. And you guys, I feel like I don't even have to say this, but I'm going to anyway. I'm not a medical professional. I'm not a doctor. I'm just showing you things that have worked well for me and my family. So keep that in mind. So here is the mullein, and I just brought the whole jar over here to show you. It's dried, and I've saved a jar of it because you can also use mullein in other forms. You can do a tincture. You can use it in teas. We've had great results using it in a tea for respiratory issues. So keep that in mind. Mullein is a good one. Another great home remedy for the cool months is one that is going to treat seasonal allergies. And right now is the prime time for this where you can find it, forage it, and save it. And that is goldenrod. So here in my jar, I have some dried goldenrod flowers. Now goldenrod is often confused with ragweed, which is what's causing most people in the fall to have allergy flare-ups. But they're actually two different plants. So look up a picture Google it and you'll quickly see the difference. Goldenrod is a bright yellow flower. It's growing everywhere right now in any field or pasture. It's in bloom in the fall. And it's so interesting that goldenrod grows right next to ragweed in many cases. And it also helps treat the symptoms of a ragweed allergy. So you can take goldenrod in a couple of ways. You can tincture it but you can also make a tea. Goldenrod tea is very soothing if you're having a seasonal allergy flare up. You guys have heard me talk before about lemon balm in our beginner herbalism class. Lemon balm is one of my absolute favorite medicinal plants that I grow in my garden. It's very soothing for anxiety and for stress. So if you tend to be a person who worries, lemon balm is gonna be your new best friend. You can use it in tinctures, you can use it in teas. I even like to put fresh lemon balm in chicken noodle soup. It adds an extra calming effect to that home, cozy home soup. So give lemon balm a try, but here I've got a lemon balm tincture in the medicine bottle like I mentioned earlier. And when you tincture herbs like this, you can see how dark it gets. And there's a few ways you can take this. Now, the easiest way for a beginner who's just learning to use tinctures is to put about five drops in a glass of juice and just drink it, okay? For a stronger effect though, you can take five drops and put them under your tongue and hold it there for at least 10 seconds. Now, it's not gonna taste good, you guys. And remember, we're making a lot of our tinctures from vodka, so there is alcohol in this. 
So, I want to point that out in case you or someone in your home doesn't want to use alcohol, that's okay. You can make vinegar tinctures with almost all of the same herbs. So, in this case, you could totally do a lemon balm and vinegar infusion and use it the same way. But take it under the tongue or in a cup of juice, and it's very calming. I like lemon balm a lot for sleep. If you tend to be restless at night, take a little lemon balm and it will help you rest. And then the final thing that I wanted to show you and share with you is echinacea. And here in this jar, I have an echinacea tincture that is in process. And I'm really excited about this particular tincture because it is a whole echinacea tincture. Now, I've been growing echinacea here at our little homestead for three years. And the thing with echinacea plants is you have to wait until the third year before you can harvest any of the root. And the root is the most potent, powerful part of the plant from a medicinal point of view. So this is the first year I've been able to actually harvest part of the root from my echinaceas. And I have made a tincture. And so in here, I've got part of the root. I have some of the leaves. And then I've also got some of the flowers, the flower heads. And it is covered in vodka. Now, remember for your tinctures, you need to use 80 to 100 proof of your vodka or whatever alcohol medium you're choosing. I look for the cheapest uh, vodka that is going to be high enough alcohol because it doesn't matter what it tastes like. It's We're using this medicinally a few drops at a time. But this echinacea tincture is going to be an excellent, like, first aid for colds, colds and flus. So when you get that first sign that you're getting sick, the tickle in your throat, that little burn in the eyes, that's when you want to take your echinacea. So you can either start a tincture then, taking it twice a day, or you can even start drinking echinacea tea. But if you use the tea for it to be really potent medicinally, you're going to have to drink it often. So we're talking, you want to aim for five to six cups of echinacea tea a day. So just sip it all day long. If you're not a fan of sipping on tea, you can do a tincture and just do the dropper. And it's a little bit easier. So those are some of the remedies that we use and love here in our home and for our family. And I hope some of those will be helpful for you. If you have other ideas for home remedies that you use and would be willing to share, I would love for you to post that in the Facebook group and share it with everyone. Let's all spread our ideas around and come up with new ways that we can support our families through the sixth season. I also want to say thank you to Julie for the wonderful lesson on how to make elderberry syrup. Julie has also provided a coupon code for her elderberry syrup kits if you want to purchase one of those. So look for that in the email that came with this video. Look for that coupon code and you can grab one of her kits at 10% off for being part of Extra Grace. So Thank you, Julie, for doing that and for teaching us today. Thank you, Extra Grace friends, for being part of this class. And I pray that you'll be blessed and you'll continue to discover all the wonders of plants every single day.